This is the second of three short videos put together by the Center for Economic and Social Rights, which looks at the connections between fiscal policy and human rights in the COVID-19 context. This second video introduces a framework for understanding the connections between human rights and fiscal policy. And it gives an overview of some of the ways that neoliberalism has influenced fiscal policy trends over the last 40 years or so, describing the effects that these trends have had both on governments and on households in terms of the way they impact people's lives and livelihoods. So the framework I'm, we're introducing is called the four R's of fiscal policy. And it's a framework that comes from tax justice advocates, but that we found in our work is also a very useful way of understanding the interlinkages between fiscal policy decisions and the impact on people's rights on their day-to-day -day lives. So first and most directly, you can see that fiscal policy determines the resources that are available to invest in the critical infrastructure, public services and social programs that are necessary to enable people to realize their rights. Increases and decreases in, that, in this funding has very direct impact on what's available to whom and where in terms of goods and services. Second, fiscal policy allows for the redistribution of benefits across society. So progressive taxation, which ensures that wealthier individuals and corporations are paying a higher proportion of tax than poorer ones, helps curb inequalities between individuals and, and between groups. Regressive taxation, which is the opposite, meaning that poor people and poor, poor, or less profitable corporations are paying a higher proportion of their income in tax, has the opposite effect. It concentrates um, resources among wealthy individuals and, and wealthy companies. The third way that fiscal policy can impact on people's rights is through regulation. Fiscal policy can essentially reprice particular behaviors, make them more costly or make them cheaper. And so it's a way to limit public bads by making them more expensive. So for example, a tax on tobacco consumption or on carbon emissions would discourage that behavior. And on the other hand, you could also use fiscal policy as a tool to encourage public goods. So for example, investing in particular sectors or investing in the employment of particular groups. Of course, this works in the opposite direction as well. Um, fiscal policy can allow the ongoing poor behavior if it's not, um, if it's not costing the you know, relevant, relevant um, companies or relevant individuals um, a particular price. Fourth, fiscal policy is linked to political representation. And on the one hand, it's widely agreed that uh, the more governments rely on revenue coming from taxation, um, as opposed to loans or as opposed to foreign aid, um, the, the more uh, accountable they are to their citizens because citizens as taxpayers have a higher vested interest in ensuring um, that the money that they're paying is well used. Again, on the other hand, though, the high concentration of, of resources, the high concentration of wealth is also linked to a concentration of political power, which can undermine democratic processes because those vested interests have an outsized influence in decisions that are being made. So as we flagged in the earlier video, the economic system that's been in place in most of the world over the last 40 years or so is often described as being neoliberal. Neoliberalism is defined as a socioeconomic and a political project that places the market at the center of all human interaction and economic growth as the goal of, of market interactions. So this means, in other words, that the economy is considered to be effective, that is, is, is considered to produce prosperity when the free market can operate without constraint and government's role in the economy is reduced. And a result of this fiscal discipline, which is demonstrated by reducing government deficits, so ensuring that they balance the books, has emerged as a priority for most governments. However, the efforts to bring government revenues closer to government expenditures has usually involved the introduction of austerity measures. 
So what does this look like in practice? For governments, it looks like rounds and rounds of tax cuts for corporations and wealthy individuals that concentrates wealth and power and enables resistance to regulation. This increases pressure to minimize public expenditure and that then leads to cuts which have gutted essential services like health and education and social protection and housing. So we've also seen as a result of that increasing privatization and for some countries in the world um, that squeeze has meant that they've needed to borrow more money often on disadvantageous terms and conditions depending on their position um, in the global financial market um, and that that increasing kind of spiraling of, of taking on more and more debt has has squeezed fiscal space even further. This has both quite direct and also more indirect impacts on households. Most directly you see kind of a loss of access to essential public services and social protection programs that places a greater burden of unpaid care work, um, especially on women. Um, it, the in decreases in spending can also lead to job cuts and wage, wage freezes, particularly in the public sector, noting again that the public sector tends to employ more women than the private sector um, proportionally, so they're harder hit uh, when, the, when those jobs are cut. Uh, it means that households need to borrow as well to maintain their standard of living. And in a context where, that, where, the, where the market is, is unregulated or underregulated, um, households can be targeted by predatory lending that again leads to spiraling debt. And you see with spiraling debt you know, a, a deterioration in well-being um, and, and vulnerability to precarious and exploitative labor conditions becoming even greater. The COVID-19 pandemic has obviously shone a spotlight on these inequities and the way that they're built into the neoliberal economic model. You know, across the world, we've seen how deteriorating public health infrastructure, precarious labor markets, and heavy and very uneven levels of care work on top of weak social protection schemes has made it all harder to respond to COVID-19. It's both made the, deadly, the virus itself more deadly and has supercharged inequality as a result. Um, Oxfam International recently calculated that it could take more than a decade for the world's poorest to recover from the impacts of the pandemic, while the 10 richest men in the world have seen their combined wealth increase by half a trillion dollars since the pandemic began. But it's also opened up space for debate about how to do things differently. And in the next video, we'll talk about what a rights-based approach to fiscal policy could look like and how that would support a just recovery to COVID-19.